Not sure what happened there, but I think we're back on the right track. <laughs> uh, so back to our panelists. Uh, we're happy to be joined today by Marsha Lewis, Dean and Professor of the School of Nursing, Pamela Paplaham, Assistant Dean of MS and DMP Programs and Clinical Professor, Catherine Mann, Assistant Dean for Undergraduate Studies and Clinical Associate Professor, Rebecca Lorenz, Assistant Dean for the PhD Program and Associate Professor, Stephen Lamkin, Manager for Research Advancement in our Center for Nursing Research, and Amy Heckenberg, Associate Professor in our school's Unit Diversity Officer and Committee Chair. So now let's begin by hearing from Dean Marshall Lewis. Thank you so much, Grace. You always put these wonderful presentations and, and discussions together, and I think it's a great way for us to at least get to see each other, even if it's just from the neck up uh, for a time. So I'm glad to see all of you. Uh, I do think that the title update with the Dean is a little bit, bit of a misnomer because what I feel my role has been is to really coordinate the really strong leadership we have in the school who is doing the work of the school along with our faculty and staff. So you're gonna be hearing a lot more in-depth, nitty gritty kinds of updates from the other folks uh, as opposed to me, because I think they are the ones who are really right down there in the trenches doing the, the hard work of the school. But I'm so pleased to be able to be a part of, of all of what we do and help to move us forward. Um, <clears throat> the only thing I wanted to mention was we had gotten one interesting uh, question and I don't, see, oh, there's Peter Johnson and Peter Johnson asked the question, hi Peter. Um, and so I just, I thought it was a really good question and I'm just gonna, can identify it quickly. It says, um, my question for the Dean centers around the School of Nursing vision for global nursing in the year of the nurse and how the nurse can support the development of nursing, nursing leaders, nursing researchers, and expansion of quality nursing education. And again, I'm, I've shared this with my other colleagues because I know they can tell you some more specifics about uh, education and research. But what struck me was um, thinking about what we do with that whole idea of global health and thinking about the fact that global health really is prioritizing or improving the health and achieving some health equity for people all over the globe. And it surely made me think as we are in the middle of this pandemic, that the pandemic has made it very clear that we are a global community and that what happens in one part of our world happens to all of us. And so, um, just wanted to share a few things that we've been doing this year, particularly in terms of uh, the year of the nurse and then some of our global health uh, activities, which of course, as you know, this since March have been curtailed in terms of actual travel, but we are not, we haven't stopped doing uh, a number of things, but we have a really interesting um, photo contest. If you haven't been on our website, take a look at the front page. There's a, a headline that talks about the year of the nurse and midwife. And it is a monthly um, photo contest where each month there is a different theme and we invite people to send photos. And one photo is um, selected each month and then it's put on our website. And we've been all the way from January through August and there are some phenomenal pictures and there are things like, in fact, the very first uh, January, uh, um, photo contest was global health. What are pictures from your global health experiences and things related to community service, uh, nursing pride, uh, science and knowledge. And the last one was self-care. And if you go on, there's a wonderful picture of one of our senior nursing students who does yoga for her self-care. And she's standing in a yoga pose that I can't imagine anybody can do on a ledge the water. It's the most phenomenal picture. So we're really trying to make, make something happen for the school every month, thinking about nursing, thinking about global health. And indeed, I think uh, the, as much as the pandemic is a very difficult thing for all of us, it has certainly opened our eyes to, opened the world's eyes to nursing and what nursing can do. And I think we've noticed that particularly in the increase in our um, student applicants. I was expecting students wouldn't, uh, you know, particularly nurses, for instance, we have an RN to BS program. And I thought those nurses are going to be busy. They're not going to have time to come and apply to a nursing program. Well, our RN to BS program has doubled in size this year. 
We are now doing a fall, spring, and summer uh, application uh, admission, and it's just been amazing. Our uh, graduate DNP programs have increased, and so it really shows that people do believe that nursing is important, and I think that's amazing. The only other thing I wanted to mention in terms of global health is that we were very fortunate a couple of years ago that one of our emeritus faculty who um, had been uh, doing a lot of global health with her husband, he, he's a physician in maybe 30 years ago in Africa, endowed a global health fund for us. So when we are able for students to travel and work uh, with others, they have a small stipend that, that really helps them with their travel funds. Um, and as last year, we were able to go to Ghana, we were able to go to Ecuador. This year, we were planning to go to Ghana again in January, but obviously we are not. However, we have, I just, uh, I, I got an email from our uh, global health coordinator, Molly Oldenburg, who's also the FNP coordinator. And she said that we have a virtual Ghana experience this fall. So that students meet together, it's interdisciplinary, it's nursing, medicine, pharmacy, and business meet together, have lectures, talk, understand what, it, what this whole experience is like. They have some students and people from Ghana who also join these Zoom meetings. And their hope is that come next year, this group of students can be really prepared to move to Ghana and do some more work. So lots of things happening. You'll hear more from others, both in education, not only across the globe, but in the United States, we go down to Appalachia. Uh, we go to American Indian reservations in New York. We work with uh, refugee communities. We have research in refugee communities. So I think there's lots of things happening in the school, even though we don't have the luxury of being able to travel right now. But uh, people are finding, as we all know, our nurses are very creative and we're finding ways to do what we want to do in spite of uh, the, the restraints and the constraints that we have. So there's lots of stuff to share, and I think we got five minutes. I probably used mine up. So I'm going to let Grace just move us along. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dean Lewis. Uh, now let's please hear from Pam about what's going on with our graduate programs. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to start off by saying thank you to everybody um, that's on the uh, Zoom or those that couldn't be here that are working on the front line. It's a very challenging time to continue to work as a frontline provider, um, whether you're a bedside nurse or you're an advanced practice nurse. Um, when many had the luxury, quote unquote, to stay home, we were still going out into the hospitals, taking care of people and really putting our lives on the line in the middle of a pandemic that we don't have good control over. So I wanted to thank everybody for their contributions and, and we have quite a few faculty that are currently on the Zoom that are still practicing as well. Um, we practice, a lot of us that are in the clinical programs practice one day a week to keep up on our skills and we have continued to do that through the pandemic. Um, and so again, I want to uh, applaud them for um, stepping up and taking care of our community. Um, and then I also obviously want to talk about our students who through this time, it has been very challenging for them because in addition to taking on a graduate education, they are trying to balance um, working as an RN, again, in, a, in this period of time where they can be come up with situations that put their own lives at risk. Um, and additionally, some of them have young children that they're homeschooling. And that has been a really difficult balance for our, our, our students. And we have tried to really, as a faculty, embrace the fact that um, these students have a lot on their plate and they have all stepped forward and done an excellent job. So um, I think everybody deserves a pat on the back because it's, it's a lot of work and, and very few have, um, have uh, dropped down on what credit hours they're taking merely because of this they've really kept up on things the people that unfortunately have had to pull back have been those that have been furloughed in their job um, it's it's kind of ironic i think in a period of time when we need healthcare providers so badly that people are being furloughed but 
those that work for elective surgical places that closed down during the pandemic, they weren't able to afford their tuition. And of course, an easy budget cut for a lot of hospitals is to cut back on tuition reimbursement. So those were more the reasons that we had some students um, had to pull back on their hours, but we really haven't seen a lot of students um, have to resign from the program because of what's going on. So just in brief, we have 178 DNP students as of this morning, which is uh, they're across a variety of different specialties uh, across the CRNA, uh, which we have Cheryl Spilecki is in charge of that program and she's uh, Carla Moscato's on the call and we have um, Eric Ledwin now. Um, they have a phenomenal program and they have clinical sites across New York State that we're using. Um, the Family Nurse Practitioner Program is led by Molly Oldenburg and she's also our global coordinator. We have the Adult Gero Nurse Practitioner Program that's led by Carla Youngquist who's on the call and Carla also has done global for us. Um, and if Caroline Montgomery's in the call, she also helps out in that program. And then we have Patty Nesbitt in the Psych Mental Health Program, who her program is growing by leaps and bounds, which we are just thrilled about because um, it's not, we, we knew it was growing because of the opioid crisis, but it's growing now because uh, we also know there's a lot of psych mental health issues that are likely going to come out of the pandemic as well. And so we really are having to really uh, reallocate resources to shore up that program. And I, I you know, I think it's phenomenal that this is really growing. Um, but I couldn't be happier with our students. We have DNP projects going. They are very meaningful, some of which have been such high quality, they have been published. And so Dr. Sasana, uh, Laura Lee Sasana is the person in charge of those projects and she's just done an incredible job evolving them and putting the rigor in them that we could publish these in journals to show what UB School of Nursing students can do to think through some of the problems that are in healthcare today. Um, and lastly, um, a shout out to Kathy Mann, who is our Assistant Dean of Undergrad, because she has really pushed forward with involving our graduate students in interprofessional education on campus. And so that is currently an evolving process, and we're hoping to get more students engaged in that. Thank you. That's all great to hear. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, Kathy, can you please provide an update on undergraduate programs next? Good afternoon, everyone. I'll echo what everybody said so far. And I'm so great to see so many joining our call today and hopefully going to listen to the archived um, taping of this phone call and our updates. Uh, busy as all of you are in your workplaces in undergraduate education. As Dean Lewis has mentioned, one of our uh, big new things that happened in um, starting last spring is we've increased the numbers in our RN to BS program. We have many um, students who are coming here right after their associate degrees. So the majority of our students now are just entering the workforce during the COVID pandemic and continuing their education. So we're hearing the same thing as at the graduate level where we have students working for 12s and trying to advance in the profession and obtain their bachelor's degree. Our goal was to hit 120 students in triple enrollment over a three year period. We looks like we're probably to have done it in three semesters. So that really shows you um, the relationship with um, UB and our community colleges in the local area, as well as across the, straight, the state. So that's very exciting to us to be playing a role in RNDBS um, education at a, a wider level now with those increase in numbers. In addition, we've you know, had the challenges. I think our last meeting was in the spring. We discussed you know, things that were going on in clinical using virtual simulation, returning students to clinical. And I'm also happy to report that all of our students are in clinical placements um, for junior and senior year. We were able to seed our ABS program in the summer uh, among, amidst everything that was going on and have them complete their first junior year this last summer. Um, they will finish um, close to on time, but are staying with us a little bit longer. Our clinical sites have a lot of changes. Those of you in clinical practice know with the creation of COVID units, there was downsizing, shuffling, um, moving around of, of staff to accommodate what is needed. And, um, yet we have been able to maintain our clinical partners and um, find clinical placements for our 124 seniors 
and 72 junior level nursing students. Students also as an update are taking their boards if you aren't aware. Um, we're a little bit behind with people getting in to take their um, NCLEX examinations. Um, and that's nas a national problem. Um, the National Council for State Boards of Nursing has really worked hard to make it easier for students to test out of state. And we do have students reporting that they have taken and passed. Um, we don't have any great rates to share with you yet as we normally would at this time because of the pandemic, but are hopeful that we'll maintain our really what's been 98 and above for the past couple years now. So we're happy about that. In addition, we're trying to maintain some degree of normalcy around here. So I came on a little bit late. We are doing our senior level rising senior, senior pinning ceremonies. We're calling them mini pinning and white coat ceremonies. And we're bringing students in six um, in their clinical groups, two clinical groups at a time, every Wednesday and Thursday, and having a wonderful ceremony where we're giving them their rising senior pins. And in addition to that, we were we received money from the Arnold P. Gold Foundation for white coat ceremonies. We held the first one last fall, which was lovely, and we are incorporating that into our mini pinning ceremonies. We also had an acknowledgement of our DAISY um, award winners. Again, those of you in clinical practice may, or in, in faculty elsewhere or here, may recognize DAISY as an award for clinicians who show compassion and caring. And we just had a DAISY um, award ceremony on Tuesday. So we're trying to really acknowledge the hard work of our students and showcase like everything that they're doing as they're pursuing the degree. And one of the other things, in addition to our wonderful numbers, I want to share with the group is that we really didn't have loss of students in terms of people not wanting to continue during the pandemic or not choosing to come. Um, we seated our classes, both ABS and junior, which really says something about our students. Um, one last note that I'd like to mention is that we've heard from alumni who have started working during the pandemic and have sh the students have really shared with us how the university has prepared them to not only enter the nursing workforce as RNs, but also enter the nursing workforce during this unprecedented time. And to, to do that, feeling some degree, I mean, they're new nurses. We all know, remember, if we think back when we were first new nurses, we had some confidence, but not a lot. And they're able to join the workforce now and feel like they were ready to do that. So I think that that's probably our greatest accomplishment of all in undergrad, that we can say our students are out there and, and they're not emailing us worried that, the, that we didn't give them something they needed. We prepared them for clinical and um, to enter the workforce during this time. That's about all. <laughs> Good to hear, thank you, Kathy. Uh, Rebecca, can you please share some information about the PhD program now? Sure. Uh, I don't think I can talk as long as everybody else, so mine will be short. Um, thanks everyone for being here. I'm very proud of our PhD program. And even though we were un unable to admit international students, we had three applicants, but they were not able to travel due to the pandemic. We still were able to admit six excellent students into our PhD program this fall and it brings our enrollment up to 31. Of the st current students, um, several have received funding for their dissertations. They've been publishing um, in peer-reviewed journals, and even with the pandemic, they've been able to con continue collecting data for research projects, even though a couple students did have to take a pause and then actually revise their research protocols to continue to collect data virtually because they were not able to go into the clinical setting and they've been successful at doing that. Actually, one of our PhD students um, had to take a pause. She works in the ICU, so um, you know we worry about her health as well as completing her PhD, but it didn't, she just has been healthy all the way through, which is great, even though she's working on a COVID unit during last spring and probably still now. Um, but anyway, she took a pause and did a additional study where she collected data from patients that were intubated and their families mainly to see how we were doing and how com 
what kind of problems they were having. And so she's analyzing that data now, and I think that'll be a great addition to um, our knowledge about how we handle people during a pandemic. I also just wanted to share that two of our students did receive funding for their dissertations. One is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is a very, very prestigious organization, and the other, the Society of Family Planning, and her research is looking at um, family planning, excuse me, <coughs> within Appalachia. So um, looking at those underserved areas. And I think that's all I have to say. Did I say our enrollment is up to 31? So our program also continues to grow. So thank you. Great, thank you for those updates. Uh, Stephen, can you please provide the research updates? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Lampkin. I'm the manager for research advancement here at the Center for Nursing Research. I work very closely with Dr. Chang and she sends her sincerest apologies that she could not be here this morning. Unfortunately, there was a scheduling conflict. So I'm just gonna lead with our, our biggest news here. This past month, the School of Nursing received its first ever grant from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is commonly referred to as PCORI uh, for short. Uh, Dr. Chang is actually the principal investigator uh, and it's a $2.5 million grant that was awarded. Uh, it also includes a large uh, team of faculty here from the School of Nursing. So the exciting thing is it's one of only seven studies that PCORI awarded um, across the country. And it came from a, a fund that was dedicated to confronting the national health crisis posed by COVID. Uh, this speaks very highly of sort of the, the reputation that we have nationally uh, for our research uh, to be chosen as one of seven organizations to receive this funding. And even more exciting is the study will benefit uh, the, the city of Buffalo community uh, as it will be testing the effectiveness of a mobile app intervention designed to improve mental health outcomes for individuals living in low income, racial and ethnic uh, minority communities. So that's super exciting news for us. Um, I know like th that COVID had such a tremendous impact on the way we were uh, working and, and delivering our education. But from a research perspective, I have to commend our faculty because they did not miss a beat. Um, this past year saw us submit the largest number of grant uh, proposals where a UB Sun faculty member was either a principal investigator or a co-investigator compared to any other academic year prior. So that speaks very highly uh, of our faculty and of our staff who support our faculty. So some of the funding highlights um, from this past uh, year, obviously, or from the past few months is the PCORI grant that was awarded that I led with. Uh, we also received a $1.5 million grant from HRSA uh, for behavioral health integration in primary care clinics in rural and underserved counties. Uh, another award from HRSA for, to Dr. Uh, Pappelham and Spelucky for a nurse anesthetist training program. Uh, we received an award to Dr. Huner from the Robert Wood uh, Johnson Foundation to improve services for vulnerable homeless populations during the pandemic uh, and beyond. And uh, an award to Dr. Sullivan from the National Institutes of Health for a study to better predict quality of life and end of life care transitions for persons with Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is just a very brief overview. I don't have time to list all of the, the awards that were funded, uh, but one of the really exciting things that I want to say about all of these proposals that have gone in and out in, of proposals that have been funded is that there's been a really strong commitment to collaboration and engagement, um, not just with other schools and departments here at UB, but a really strong commitment to engaging our community and to including our students in on the research that we're doing. Um, as Dr. Lorenz just noted in her presentation, many of our PhD students were recipients of funding through these awards. Um, and we're really seeing that many of our other students are being included in these projects, either as student workers or student researchers. And this is having the benefit of not only increasing funding for students, but they're gaining real world, world leadership and experience, um, being included in conference presentations, poster presentations, and even as authors on research publications. Um, truly the way faculty are designing these projects, the roles that students are playing in the research is having tremendous impact on them. And I think we're helping to create excellent uh, nurse researchers and nurse leaders moving forward. Um, we're also really engaging community stakeholders. Uh, I know the Center for Nursing Research, we've 
participated in many uh, meetings these past months with community partners, such as churches, community centers, different community organizations, um, and healthcare community professionals from rural, small rural primary care clinics up to multi-county wide health networks. Um, there's been a great deal of time and effort put into developing meaningful collaborations, and that's been evidence in some of the success rates that we've seen with these proposals being funded. Um, and I know, so at the beginning, uh, there, it was posed about the question uh, about global and what we're doing. And I, I know most of our research is local. Um, we do have a couple projects that are going on right now. I know Dr. Chang is working on a project uh, with some Taiwanese um, researchers about COVID and some of that can be replicated, but really we're working with a lot of our proposals that are going in, we're, we're kind of working with very diverse populations, uh, vulnerable populations, and we're sort of teaching students um, how to think about preparing, we're preparing our students to think bigger than just their comfort zone. So working with populations that they may have not typically worked with. So I think that's really something that this research, even though it's at the local level, these successes can be replicated um, at the regional level, state level, nationally, and then eventually globally. So that's pretty much the, the update from us. So on behalf of Dr. Chang, I just want to apologize again that she couldn't be here. And I thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. And then uh, last but not least, Amy, can you please tell us a bit about what's going on with our Diversity and Inclusion Committee at the School of Nursing? I'd be happy to. Thanks everyone for coming today. I'm a bit of the new face in the mix. Um, I just became the, um, I was just appointed as the unit diversity officer and the chair of the Committee on Diversity and Inclusion for our school um, in the last few months. And I can't deny it's been a really extremely challenging time to take on this role. Um, this crisis that we face in our country regarding pervasive and, and institutionalized racism has really served as an impetus for us to take stock of ourselves, you know, on an individual level, but also as a unit here in the School of Nursing. But I'm really proud to say that we've worked diligently over the last few months to make changes that are, that are gonna strengthen our school's commitment to supporting and equitably treating all of our faculty, students, and staff, regardless of individual differences and backgrounds. Um, the first notable uh, diversity and inclusion event this summer was a nursing student town hall in June. And during that town hall, we heard candidly from our students about areas in need of improvement in our school. And these included a lack of mentoring and role models for our underrepresented minority students, gaps in our curriculum in terms of educating our students about the structural determinants of health as they apply to health disparity populations, and also some blind spots in our student services. And these conversations were super important and resulted in a number of initiatives for the upcoming academic year and beyond. So first, um, as a result of those conversations, we created two subcommittees within the Diversity and Inclusion Committee that are focused on mentoring and curriculum development. And we've made progress on both of those fronts, particularly as it relates to um, supporting our students through mentoring and role modeling. Um, I, I see some familiar faces here, so I know that some of you had an opportunity to attend our first official event of the academic year that was held last week called Filling in the Gaps, a discussion about professional challenges with race and nursing. And for that conversational forum, we welcome five practicing nurse, nurses. Some of them were um, our own alumni, and they shared um, with the audience their experiences as black nurses. And I'm really pleased to say that this event was um, very well attended and very well received by the audience, including our students. And I'm also super excited to report that it has spurred a conversation with a local nursing organization to begin planning for um, a collaborative mentoring program that will help support our underrepresented minority students. We're also moving forward with efforts um, to take an inventory of our curriculum related to diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice in order to fill any gaps um, in learning for our students across uh, our programming. And the folks in academic, our academic advisement office have been extremely responsive to student feedback and they're currently instigating several new strategies to ensure student satisfaction in their advisement experiences. And these include um, things like surveying students and conducting focus groups to identify gaps and also establishing a peer mentoring program to link our graduate nursing organization members with newer undergraduate students. 
It's also the goal of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee to pursue a variety of events, speakers, and training opportunities in the coming academic year that will advance the knowledge and skills of our student staff and faculty. And among other topics, we're planning to have speakers come in and talk about civility, implicit bias, microaggressions, and personally, given my expertise in conducting research about the health of gender and sexual minorities, I'm really excited to um, be look to uh, welcome a nurse practitioner who um, will be speaking about his experiences caring for transgender patients at Mount Sinai Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery. And there are other events that we're also um, planning, so stay tuned about those. Um, all this programming, of course, requires funding support. And I'm super pleased to say that, and proud to say, that Dean Lewis and her partner, Roy, have generously donated personal funds to start the Sun Jedi Fund. Jedi stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Information about that funding um, opportunity and uh, ways to donate can be found in the chat today. I think um, uh, Amanda's going to pop them in there. And they'll also appear in the email follow-up. Um, they're also soon going to be on the Boldly Buffalo fundraising page for the School of Nursing. Um, I encourage you to please consider making a gift to this cause. I promise it's going to go to good use. Um, I also encourage you to send your suggestions to our committee for educational and training opportunities that you think um, we should uh, pursue. And our contact information will be included in the follow-up email from Grace. I just have to say that it really takes a community of caring people to create sustainable change. And I want to acknowledge that the progress we've made um, in such a short amount of time, I look back, it's just been a couple months. Um, and the efforts that we plan to pursue going forward will, you know, really can't be, wouldn't have been possible without the support of Dean Lewis. And quite frankly, so many others in our school that it's just not possible to individually name them here. Um, as a school of nursing, we're already prepared to go above it and beyond to care for others. And it's really that tradition and dedication to service that gives me confidence that we're gonna come out of this on the other side, come out of this crisis stronger, more resilient, and I think perhaps most importantly, better equipped to educate our future nurses to treat their patients in compassionate ways that acknowledge and value difference. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and be part of the team and look forward to providing y'all with some um, updates as time goes by. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you again all for providing those very thorough updates. It was great to hear what's going on at the School of Nursing this semester. Uh, now we want to hear from you. Does anyone have any questions that they want to ask our school leadership? Or perhaps anyone want to share what they're up to right now or how they're dealing with this pandemic? You may feel free to unmute yourself at this time if you'd like, or you can also post something in the chat if you are more comfortable with that. Hello, this is Betty Noyes, class of 65 and based in Portland, Oregon at the moment. Um, I have been active on the uh, Portland University School of Nursing Advisory Committee here, and we, they ran into a big problem with clinical placements and uh, the, the balance between clinical placement and simulation. And I, I commend you for having placed your students because it was not easy here. What sort of depressed me after 35 years of operations experience was that the issues seemed to be about um, COVID testing, about PPD, and it seemed to me to be a very, um, you know, easy issue to resolve, you know, wave my magic wand. But it was, it was a significant concern that in order to have a clinical placement, the student had to be tested for COVID and had to obviously have sufficient PPD, and it, it wasn't, um, did I say PPD? I meant PPE, but <laughs> uh, anyway, the, um, that is an issue that is still ongoing here. I think it's pretty much resolved now, but it was a matter of funding for very basic kinds of things. So congratulations for your success and your clinical placement. If you have any words of wisdom you want to share with Portland, um, I will be pleased to be the conveyor of that information or include um, Dean Lewis with uh, Dean Casey Shillam out here. Thank you. Betty, I do want to mention that we don't have that testing 
Um, our sites are not requiring testing of students. So that alone is probably one of the, the, one of the things that we don't have as a hurdle that you're having there. And that, that's a big hurdle. Um, not that we, we do have the availability to, of testing and we are testing more students at UV, but in general, um, there's no one that required that testing of students. So that, that itself probably was a big piece of it. I would add one more thing, and that is so it's sort of an advocate and a concern for what's happening in our long-term care facilities, that uh, there was considerable discussion about the equivalent placement in long-term care rather than acute care. And that's an interesting ball to play in the court. This is Carla. I'm um, the program coordinator for the AGNP program. And when you started talking about the uh, clinical placements, I, I thought about my nurse practitioner students and what we could do with our students so that we could, you know, keep them in their clinical. Um, and we found two platforms to actually do online simulations that the students really loved. They uh, you know, we can only limit so many hours in on doing those uh, simulations online. But the students felt like it really kept their hands in it while they weren't able to go in the clinical setting. Um, so the two platforms we used are uh, EHR. And that platform allowed us to really develop our own uh, patient scenarios. And so we could tailor it towards whether they were going to do primary care, or if they were going to do acute care, uh, and really challenge the, the patients in real scenarios that other students have had. So I, I, I credit Dr. Montgomery, our faculty, who really was able to um, sort of personalize that simulation events. Uh, and, and it actually prepares them to go into clinical practice also. Uh, and the other one is um, Shadow Health. We found that very helpful. The students really enjoy uh, both of those platforms. Although the, you know, the hours are limited that you can do simulation um, for licensure regulations, but um, both of those were really helpful to get over the hump. And, and, and our clinical preceptors now have been so understanding in allowing us students to come back into uh, the clinical settings. I just want to add on to what Carla just said, and I want to give a shout out to Dean Lewis because we were really strapped with advanced with with our clinical for our nurse practitioner students and what to do with them. And she um, really allowed us to push forward with the platforms that Carla mentioned, uh, including Shadow Health for some of our core classes, um, and 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 paying those fees for the students while we were kind of limited in what we could do with them. So I I really want to thank the Dean and the administration for giving us the funds to push forward with these platforms that we really needed because we, we didn't know how we were going to get these students through because as Carla mentioned, we were limited by how many hours you can put over to simulation that are not that, that are direct patient care, but continue to give them the tools they need to be successful uh, providers um, in the community. So um, I really think the school rallied behind uh, the, the what we could do to help push our students along through a very unsure period of time. Hi, I'm Robin Brown from the Visiting Nursing Association. Um, and I just wanted to, to say that um, though Collada did suspend for a moment briefly when the pandemic started, um, suspend students transitioning through that we are now continuing to host UB students um, and I just want to speak to what Dr. Mann said. I have seen phenomenal um, ambition in the students that have graduated. Um, we started our cohort two um, at the beginning of this month. But prior to that, um, for several months, um, many of your graduated students um, really rose to the occasion and worked in the clinic, the COVID clinics that we were serving the community. Um, and they showed such concern about the community. And um, 
really mm -hmm. was not afraid to step into um, an area that many of our seasoned nurses were a little bit ambivalent about going into. Um, so it really showed the character of the students that were graduating. Um, they also, the cohort, the first cohort that we started last year graduated from the nurse residency program. And many of them have stepped up into to more leadership type roles, such as going to specialty team. Um, we have formed a COVID team, um, which we have a few of the new grads from UB uh, from last year that actually, uh, you know, volunteered to participate in. So it's just kudos to your nursing program and your nursing graduates. Would anyone else like to ask any questions or share what they're up to around this time? Hi everyone, um, this is Amanda Rebeck. I work in the School of Nursing as their Advancement Officer. Um, I thought it important to give you an update um, since our last meeting, um, specifically about our Student Emergency Fund. We've talked about how different the world is for our students amid COVID. And when we first had our meeting, we talked about the great need our students were um, experiencing as a result of COVID. And I wanted to give an update that since our last meeting, we've been able to award out almost $25,000 in funds to our students that were in need throughout COVID for a variety of different reasons. Um, but I'm really proud of the School of Nursing and the support of our faculty, staff, and alumni that have contributed to that fund. We have not had to turn away a single student that has been in need of our support during this really difficult time. Um, so thank you to anyone here that has contributed to that at any point in time. Um, there still remains a need there, but um, I'm just so proud to represent advancement in the School of Nursing and be able to say we've done some really great things for our students during this time. Hi, I'm Linda McCausland and I'm a former faculty member and my concerns um, with teaching would have been um, how safe is it for those beginning students who are going out into the clinical area, you know, worrying about how good they are at uh, maintaining their uh, isolation technique and all of that. Um, are, do we still have the dedicated education unit working so that um, they're being closely watched that way or how is it working with faculty? So Oops, sorry, my, my alarm goes off at the same time I unmute. Um, we, we have a couple of things going on, Linda, in terms of the DEUs. Uh, mainly, um, well, Robin with the VNA, so we still have a DEU there. But mainly our clinical partners um, told us before we turned, returned to clinical that they couldn't guarantee a DEU environment. And the big reason behind that is because many of the nurses were displaced to other units. So the units that we had DEUs on, and actually two of them in particular became COVID units. So our students don't go, our undergraduate students do not go on a COVID unit or knowingly care for a patient who is COVID positive. So the DEUs, we continue to use them, but right now they're kind of on hold. Some of the units that functioned like DEUs in the past that are not COVID units, although they're not saying they're quote unquote DEUs, are somewhat functioning like that because the nurses are used to, you know, taking the students under their wing and, and working one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one with them. In addition, and I can't remember if I said this already, so I, only because I, because I talked at something else this morning, so I apologize if I said it here or there, but the, we have um, Dr. Joanne Sands, who is a background in disaster preparedness, has worked with Dr. Fabry to create um, these online modules specific to entering clinical during COVID. So students do the online modules, plus they take little quizzes throughout. So you have to make sure they're paying attention, right? So throughout the process, they're doing these little quizzes so that we feel that we're giving them that extra, um, not just the normal classroom component of it, but also that. And there's just been a high priority of, um, you know, infection control, you know, just back to the basics, the importance of communication and infection control are just paramount right now in all that we do. So 
Um, th those are our ways of trying to keep, um, keep up to date um, with everything that's going on. Our clinical coordinator, Michelle McKay, also is in constant um, communication with the coordinators at the hospital systems or clinical sites. So if there is a new protocol that comes out, and most recently, one of the big new things that's coming out um, is that they want everybody to be wearing, have goggles. We had anticipated this happening because the CDC had made some recommendations about you know, wearing eye coverage or goggles or shields. We initially had ordered face shields for all of the students, but some of the clinical sites said we couldn't bring them and we ordered goggles. So all of our students do bring goggles. Um, so when we talked about PPE, Betty, in terms of what we bring, we, the students do bring their own goggles but we are not providing any masks or anything like that. The, the facilities are providing those. So um, there's just a heightened awareness and we've included heightened um, education about this also. Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask? All right, well, if that's the case, I think now would be a good time to wrap up. I don't wanna waste anyone's time if there's nothing else to discuss. So I just wanna thank you all for taking the time to meet with us today. It was so great to hear from everyone and see some of your faces. Um, as a reminder, we will be following up with an email later today. It's gonna to include uh, this recording and then links to some of the information that we discussed. If you have any unanswered questions or questions that you think about after the fact, you can feel free to reach out to me directly. My email is grace, G-E-R, at buffalo.edu, or you can simply just reply to that follow-up email and I'll get back to you. Uh, before we sign off though, Marsha, is there anything that you wanted to add? I just want to say, take a look down at the bottom of your screen. Carrie Gavin is on, and you, you see the picture of her. That is going to be the picture on our nursing magazine that's coming out in about a month. It's a wonderful magazine. I encourage you all to read it from cover to cover. Carrie's one of our star uh, alums and has been working so hard that it, we just think it's a, a great picture to demonstrate nursing. So thanks for putting that up, Carrie. Um, I guess I just wanted to say that as I listen to everything, my heart swells because I know what we're doing, but when I hear it all together, I, I really believe that nursing is doing the best we can. And yes, there will be pitfalls and yes, there are issues. But I think overall, if I look at the rest of the university and I look at the School of Nursing, I'm very proud and confident that we're doing everything we can to keep our students healthy, our faculty and staff healthy, but to educate the students to be the best they can be, whether it's for practice or leadership or education or research. And so I'm, I'm just very proud to be part of you all. And I thank those of you who are our alums for, for joining us and for all that you have, have done and are doing. So hope we can keep doing these. And as you see, there's always updates. Things will change um, and, and we'll let you know what they are. But feel free to, to you know, get in touch. I'm, I'm Mar Lewis at buffalo.edu. If anybody wants to contact me, we're always available to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marsha. Uh, well, that is everything for now. I wish you all a wonderful week and we look forward to connecting with you soon. Have a great day.